I posted your bio in the uh, sort of events promo thing that I put up a couple of days ago when you agreed to interview with me. So I, if people were interested in watching, uh, they hopefully read it. But maybe just very, very briefly tell people who you are, um, a little bit about your background and so forth. Sure. Well, I am uh, an apologist. Um, I write on various websites, uh, including Christian Apologetics Alliance, AnsweringMuslims.com, CrossExamined.org, and various other venues. I'm the founder of the Apologetics Academy, the website being apologetics-academy.org. And basically, I run a weekly online apologetics webinar every Saturday, uh, 8 p.m. here in the UK or 3 p.m. Eastern time, um, where I bring on different scholars, experts, scientists, philosophers, from across the theological spectrum, and I give them up to an hour to present um, their arguments relating to the truth of the, of the Christian worldview. We also discuss other issues, such as social issues that are of interest to Christians and so on. And uh, so I've, I've brought on many leading Christian thinkers and also many of the leading atheist thinkers as well, and also some Muslim thinkers and people of other faith perspectives. Um, my academic training is in biology. I have a bachelor's degree with honors in forensic biology. I also have a master's degree in evolutionary biology, and I also have another master's degree in molecular biology. I'm currently a PhD student, and um, I've spoken internationally in Europe, North America, and South Africa. Where, where are you in your PhD program right now? Like, are you just starting in the middle or near the end? Um, I'm about a year away from finishing. Okay. So you're going crazy? You're going nuts with the <laughs> dissertation writing and all that? Yeah, I'm still gathering data. I'm, I'm, I do bioinformatics at the moment, so... Is your the title of your dissertation less than ten words? I haven't uh, ha I haven't got a full title yet. I, I haven't formulated what the actual final title is going to be at this point. But okay, yeah. Okay, and how much uh, uh, do you know about me? Um, I hadn't actually come across you until you well you added me on Facebook, and then um, I got more familiar with you when you uh, called into my webinar a couple weeks ago and interacted with Lydia and Tim, and uh, and then I watched, of course, your follow-up video where you talked with uh, with your friend Cam and with Daniel and with your Christian friend Chris. Yeah, um, so just to let you let, know a little bit about myself, born and raised in a log cabin in Canada. Um, and let's see, how much did I sh say? I was raised in the Mennonite culture. Are you familiar with Mennonites? I am, I'm familiar, yeah. Okay, so very conservative Christian culture. Uh, kind of left that when I was 15, um, but I would consider myself a Christian, uh, Protestant, evangelical Christian, all my life, uh, from Mennonite to, it's been like two or three years in a Pentecostal church, but mostly because that's where my wife now um, uh, was going to church at the time. Been in many different types of denominations from seeker sensitive, you know, those guys who just want to get people into the pews and play this rock and roll music and uh, to Baptist to um, non-denominational. My final pit stop was in the Presbyterian hardcore Calvinist church uh, in my early 30s. And uh, not to poo poo on the Calvinists and the Presbyterians too much, but that was my last stop. And uh, um, probably in my mid thirties started embracing doubt and, uh, viewing myself in the third person, uh, asking myself, why do I really believe what I believe? Uh, by my 40 ish, I would say I was a deist I thought, oh, you know, something can't come from nothing. There has to be a God out there, but I, I'm not a Christian anymore, but you know, I still believed in some type of deity. Uh, but then by my early 40s, I said, you know what, I really don't have good reasons th to believe that there is a deity out there. Um, so I call myself an atheist now, but that word means different things to different people. What I mean when I say I'm an atheist is that I don't live my life like there is a God of any sort or gods. Um, and I don't say that there can't be one or that there is no God out there. I just say that I don't believe there is. And, um, and I don't live my life like there is. Mm -hmm. Not to say I live a life of chicanery and debauchery, but... <laughs> <laughs> um, so we first met when you posted something about my friend Reed's video. 
You know, oh, okay. who read it? Yeah, yeah. I, I know the video you mean, yeah. Yeah, that's how I first uh, saw you or, or was introduced to you. And, and I remember reading a comment that you wrote that said something about how disappointed you were in um, the Christian youth today. Mm -hmm. Is that mm -hmm. accurate? That's correct. And, um, and then I saw a few more comments like that when you responded to some of Anthony Magnabosco's videos. Mm -hmm. And it seems like you were saying that there needs to be more of a, a true good apologetics to equip the young people, the, the Christian young people. And so I was going to ask your permission to do something. Mm -hmm. And feel free to say no to it. But um, would you like to demonstrate how you would answer questions? Like from an Anthony Magnabosco or from a Reed? Like I'm not a strict SE type guy. I, I don't, if you've watched any of my videos, I'm more of a conversational dialogue type guy. But I'm willing to do strict SE with you, if you're willing. Sure, absolutely. Go ahead. Okay. And I'm going to do it exactly like, well, not exactly, but I'm going to try to do it like Anthony and Reed do it, do it by even putting up a, a clock here. <laughs> and they usually go five minutes, but um, let's go ten because, hey, we got time. <laughs> <laughs> so <clears throat> we already know what you believe, but you're, you're a Christian and you believe that Jesus Christ rose from the dead. Mm -hmm. Can I get a sense of your confidence? And since you're from the UK, I'll do it in terms of stone from zero stone to hundred stone. <laughs> <laughs> How confident are you that the core proposition of Christianity, the main one that Jesus bodily rose from the dead and is a God in flesh. How confident are you that that's actually true? Okay, would you be prepared first to calibrate your scale? Say, what would be yes. your degree of confidence that, say, Abraham Lincoln existed as an historical figure on a scale of 0 to 100? So I'll answer this way. I'll say, okay, I am confident um, that I'm 99.9999% I'm confident when I drop this pen, it will fall. So let's use that as, as the sense of confidence. Compared to a pen falling, how confident mm -hmm. are you that your belief that Jesus rose from the dead is actually true? I would say um, on the order of 99%. 99%. Okay. Yeah. So, so that's, you're leaving yourself a little bit of wigger room, but you're pretty confident. Yeah. So my next question would be, what would you say is the primary reason why your confidence is so high? Sure. Um, I would say it's a cumulative case. So it's not just one piece of evidence. It's not like, um, okay, here's the evidence that gets me to that level of confidence. It's the fact that there's such a um, a large number of different facts which can which point uh, convergently towards that conclusion that yes, um, the the gospel records of Jesus' life and the Book of Acts and so on are substantially true in what they record, and that uh, Jesus in fact did rise from the dead. What would you say? would be the primary reason you believe the Bible is true and that it's historically accurate? Um, again, it's a cumulative case, so it's not just one reason or one major reason. I mean, my, one of my favorite uh, arguments in relation to the substantial veracity of Scripture is the argument from undesigned coincidences in Scripture. Can you expound on that a little bit? Sure. Well, an undesigned coincidence is, uh, at least the classical form of an undesigned coincidence, is when you have two or more historical accounts which uh, recount an event and they interlock in a way that's unexpected if one is copying from the other or if both are copying from a common source or if the story is simply being made up. So I can give examples if you wish. Okay. So the main reason why you believe that you're 99% confident that the Jesus Christ rose from the dead is because of undesigned coincidences? Well, undesigned coincidences support the substantial veracity of Scripture, or the Gospels and Acts, in, in relation to Jesus in particular, uh, and, and support the Gospels being linked or connected to eyewitness testimony. Now, in relation to the resurrection of Jesus, I would use um, various arguments. For instance, I think we can show with a high degree of confidence that the earliest proclamation of the apostles of Jesus was that Jesus had rose, risen bodily from the dead and had appeared to them, and they were willing to die for that belief. 
Okay, so if you saw, so the reason why you're highly confident is because eyewitness testimony and that people were willing to die for a belief. Am I hearing you correctly? That these will be among the among the strong reasons, yeah. Okay. So if this is outsider test of faith, if if someone claimed that they saw someone else rise from the dead and that this person claimed to be a god and were willing to die for that belief, would that make that belief true? You need to give me a lot more details on the particular circumstances. So um, in this case, in the case of, re of the resurrection of Jesus, we have uh, the fact that uh, we can show with a high degree of confidence that Jesus' original apostles claimed that Jesus had risen and had appeared bodily, physically with them, with um, to them, that the resurrection appearances are polymodal in character. That is to say that they involve not just sight, but also conversation, group conversation, uh, physical contact, uh, eating with, and so on, um, touching, um, and um, and and. Uh, they were so confident that Jesus had risen from the dead in that way and had appeared to them in, the, in that polymodal fashion that they were willing to die for that belief, which evidences that they were at least sincere in that belief. And then the next question is, okay, so how did they come to sincerely believe that? And in the case of the resurrection of Jesus, I think the best explanation is the truth of the resurrection hypothesis. The best explanation. Okay. Correct. So how would you know if you were wrong that that was maybe not the best explanation? Is there any way that you could figure out if you were mistaken with this belief? Okay, uh, let me uh, just uh, to get some clarity on the question. Let me ask you uh, this: What, what, how would you know th whether you were wrong about the existence of Abraham Jonathan? Lincoln? I'm uh, Jonathan. I'm asking you the questions. You can ask me when we're done. Right. The ten minutes. Okay, because the because the, the, the reason I would ask that question is because um, you know the whole work the the whole body of evidence in the case of say Abraham Lincoln's existence would have to be very very radically different in order for me to be convinced that Abraham Lincoln in fact did not exist. And in the case of say the resurrection of Jesus or the substantial ver veracity of the gospel accounts and so on, the the whole. Um, array of evidence would have to be so radically different if that was the case that it's not really a hypothesis that I seriously entertain. Okay, well, let's use Abraham Lincoln then. Um, would you be 99% confident that Abraham Lincoln was God in flesh who, and rose from the dead if historical records said so? Uh, not necessarily. We need to go into the nature of those historical records and the nature of the evidence of particular circumstances and so on. So, I mean, there, there's other, there's other um, examples of radical claims in history. Um, I mean, I, I don't believe that Muhammad was a prophet just because certain historical records say so. Um, so. Okay. So you don't believe that historical records are, aren't always true. Why do, you, why do you believe that in the case of the Gospels, that even the claims that they saw arisen Jesus is true? Why do you believe that? I believe it's the best explanation given the particulars of the case in this particular instance. But why do you believe that even the particulars of the case are what they say they are? Uh, because I've looked carefully at the evidence for that. So if someone else looks at the evidence that Mormonism is true and is convinced that that's true, how would they know that they're mistaken? Well, I think in the case of uh, the Book of Mormon, um, I mean, the Book of Mormon is set almost entirely in fantasy land. I mean, even the civilizations, the people, um, the, the Lemonites, the Nephites, and so on, the, the events is, um, that allegedly took place, um, all of that, there, there's no historical documentation for even the language that the Book of Mormon is supposedly written in, which is a form of Egyptian, um, has never been documented to be a, a language that was ever spoken. Um, I mean, there's evidence that the um, the Native Americans are not descended from the Hebrews, but are in fact descended from a from the Asians. So, I mean, there's a whole array of evidence against uh, the Book of Mormon being um, a revelation. Uh, okay, that's to great. Joseph Smith. So, you mentioned some very specific things that could point to the fact that Mormonism is not true. Could you point to anything in your belief that you could possibly see to to lower your confidence that Jesus maybe didn't rise from the dead? In principle, uh, yes. Um, if we didn't have all the evidence we have, then that would certainly lower my confidence significantly that Jesus rose from the dead, yeah. Is there any evidence that you could possibly see in the future that would change your mind? Uh, in principle, um, uh, for instance, 
um, if you could show that if Jesus never existed, if there was good evidence Jesus never existed, which I think could in principle be shown, of course, that would significantly lower my confidence uh, in the truth of Christianity. In fact, it would, do, it would refute Christianity if that was the case. Or if, um, if say, the thesis of um, the Zeitgeist movie, which was, um, which as you know, is a, a very um, ridiculous um, claim that Jesus is an amalgamation of mythical characters. If that had merit to it, then that would lower my confidence significantly. Or um, yeah, there, there's quite a number of ways that you could use to, to lower my confidence. Yeah. Is there any? So far, I, I, when I asked you why you believe what you believe, what's the primary reason you you pointed to historical documents? Is there any other reasons? that give you high confidence, like something today um, that you would either experience or see that give you, gives you a high degree of confidence? It's primarily looking at the historical data and evidence that convinces me. I mean, people of different religious traditions claim personal, subjective spiritual experience, and I like to measure or um, spiritual or personal experiences against the objective evidence, which is done by looking at um, the historiographical record. Okay. So you would not say that, you know, experiencing the love of Jesus or anything on a daily basis is not the reason for your confidence? The reason for my confidence is looking at the historical evidence. Okay, very good. Okay, so we got 16 seconds left. We'll stop there because that's a good spot to, to stop. Okay, so I just want to recap. So I asked you what you believed, and it's basically that Jesus rose from the dead in bodily form. I asked you uh, how confident you were. You said 99%. And then I asked you, why do you believe? And you said it was um, a combination of many things. But when I try to narrow you in, you said eyewitness testimony and um, martyrdom, basically. Um, I asked what would change your mind. And I think you said nothing. Am I right? Actually, I gave I gave several examples which, in principle, would lower my confidence. That refresh my memory. So I said, for instance, if there were good arguments that Jesus didn't exist, that would certainly um, not okay. just reduce yes, my confidence, but refute Christianity. Yeah. Um, or if you could show convincingly that Jesus is an amalgamation of mythical characters, like some people have tried to argue unconvincingly, then that would significantly lower my confidence. Or even if you, if you could demonstrate um, that Jesus' body is still in the tomb, although I think it would be very difficult to actually get right, right. compelling evidence for that. But if you could show that, that would, that would refute Christianity. Okay. Yeah. The, the reason why I didn't remember the Jesus existed part, because um, even if he did exist, that doesn't necessarily mean he rose from the dead in Bali. Right. right. But, if, but, but, if he didn't, but if he didn't exist, that means he yeah. didn't, of course, rise from the dead. Right. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Okay. Very good. So how did that feel? Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I, I've watched quite a lot of the street epistemology videos, so I'm, I'm quite familiar with how they work. Um, my personal concern about the street epistemology technique is that um, to ask someone the question, uh, what would it take to lower your confidence in the truth of Christianity? Uh, the answer to that is, well, I mean, or, 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 if, or if you didn't have that piece of evidence, this is often asked, if you didn't have that piece of evidence, would that significantly lower your confidence in this belief? And um, for me, the answer is, uh, w w one, has to, one has to think about it in terms of the nature of a cumulative case. So a cumulative case is where you have lots of different elements of evidence which all converge on this conclusion. And so if we were to remove one piece of evidence, that wouldn't significantly reduce my confidence. So we know that the Earth is 4.6 billion years old because of a huge array of different lines of evidence. Now, if one of those evidences turned out not actually to be as convincing as we thought it was, that wouldn't significantly reduce my confidence in the age of the Earth because there'd still be a lot of other evidence. Um, yeah, so that's I, one I hear what you're saying, critique. Jonathan. Um, yeah. Well, I guess for a guy like me, the question is, are each of those individual evidences a reliable way of coming to knowledge? Mm-hmm. And so uh, I'm in the finance world, and I used to work with venture capitalist firms. And oftentimes you would have these struggling companies, and then some guy with money would say, oh, why don't we just combine all the companies together, and, and we'll probably have a profitable company. <laughs> and, mm -hmm. there's, and oftentimes there's no guarantee of that. In fact, it's the opposite the case. And so I guess my question is, if the individual reasons are maybe not reliable in themselves, does that mean the culmination of all those reasons put together make it any more reliable? 
Uh, if they are not good reasons, then no, of course. Um, okay. But I think they are good reasons. Otherwise, I wouldn't use them. Right. I understand that. Okay. Um, and I guess for, like, I have a guy named Billy, who's a good friend of mine. And he kind of gave me a, an epiphany the other day. And, that, and this is why I asked you that last question just before the timer ran out about, is there something today that convinces you? Like not looking back 2000 years ago at the historical record, but something in your life today that you say, yes, Jesus is real, Jesus is true. And you kind of shocked me with your answer. I was expecting you to say, well, I do feel Jesus in my life. I do feel his presence. I do experience his love. But you chose not to say that, and I'm curious why. So I would, I would say that, yes, I, I do have a personal relationship with God, and I do feel I experience God. But I also recognize that there are people of different religious traditions which would also say that. And so I measure my personal subjective experience against the objective and publicly available evidence that everyone has access to. Okay, yeah, and I think that's a great answer, and I agree with you. Um, but it seems to me that I've done a lot of interviews, and, I've, and it, it seems like the real reason that people believe is not because of all the things you talked about that happened 2,000 years ago as far as the, the historical evidence, but it's what they experience in their life today. And, and whether they're right or wrong, or whether those reasons are bad or good, those are the powerful reasons why people believe. Would you agree with that? And I've actually spoken to people uh, about, okay, so um, when I run conferences or when I speak at conferences and I do sort of interactive workshops and I'll ask people uh, to give, to you know, put them in groups and have group discussions and I say, give me three good reasons why I believe Christianity is true. And I'll always get people coming back and saying, well, um, I believe Christianity is true because I've seen answers to prayers in my life. And so mm -hmm. then I'll ask the question as a follow-up, okay, so how many... Um, prayers would it take not to be answered in the way that you are expecting how many of those would it take for you to lower your confidence yeah. in that evidence um and for me that I th and because it's very difficult to actually um get a handle on all the different um parameters that, that are involved in whether god is going to answer prayers or not i think it's very difficult to actually make an argument from that so i i, I wouldn't ever base an argument on answers to prayers because and um, people pray things and it doesn't happen the way that they are expecting or wanting. Well, the, it, it, and I agree with everything you just said, but the reason why I ask this question is because I'm wondering if you're giving the answers you're giving to me because you know they're the most defensible, but maybe they're not actually true of why you personally, Jonathan McClatchy, believe what you believe. Because, and here's, and I could be totally wrong with what I'm saying, but here's why I'm saying it. Because I've talked to a lot of people in the past, well, most of my life, actually, and I ask them these questions, and they'll answer similarly to what you've answered, the mature ones, at least, the mature Christians. But when I get down to the nitty-gritty, to, to the brass tacks, where the rubber hits the road, eventually I hear them say things like, but Doug, when I was 18 years old, you wouldn't believe what I saw. Or when I was 21, you wouldn't believe what I experienced. How do you explain that? And I can't help but think, and maybe I'm wrong for doing this, but I can't help to think that this is the real reason they believe. And it, right. yeah, go ahead. So, so yeah, I think Christians, including myself, do see answers to prayers in our own lives. But And, and I think it's quite plausible to interpret those to God, but it's not as evidence for the truth of Christianity. I think it only becomes plausible having already demonstrated on other grounds that Christianity is actually true. Yeah, I. But tell me if you agree with this. Like you, you sound like you have a similar background to me. Uh, kind of like, born and raised in a Christian home, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, and you know, can't really remember a time when you were not a Christian. And especially when you get into the ages of, I don't know, like late teens, you start asking the questions like, do I really? Like, am I just believing this because my parents did? You know, everybody kind of goes through that no matter what religion you're in. And then you do all the research and you read the apologetic books and so forth. And you realize, wow, I, you know, the core propositions of what I believe are true. Like, I've done the research and, um, 
It's not just because of the way I was raised. And I see this in every religion as well, where people, young people go through this, this struggle. I've talked to a lot of Muslims who will say the same thing. I wasn't a serious Muslim, but in my late teens, I did the research, and man, you wouldn't believe the evidence there is for the Quran. It's just mind-blowing. And they'll talk like this. And so the question I have for you is, do you think that, or how do we, if, if you and I both value truth, how do we get rid or control for this inherent bias within us, no matter what background you come from, but we have this inherent bias of how we even view the evidence. Mm -hmm. How do we control for that so that we're coming to knowledge in a reliable way? Uh, yeah, that's an excellent question. And this is actually one of the reasons why I host my weekly Apologetics Academy webinar and why I bring on atheist scholars to come and talk to us, because I feel that a lot of people, not just in the Christian community, but also in the atheist community and the Muslim community and so on, who are tunnel visioned in that they limit their reading um, and their engagement with resources to those resources which already agree with their paradigm, their worldview. Um, and so by bringing on some of the leading critics of the gospel, critics of the Christian faith, um, I allow um, my audience, which is mostly Christians, to, be, um, to, to come to a better understanding and clarification of where other people who don't share their worldview are coming from. Um, and so I, that's why I give the speaker a whole hour uninterrupted to present their best arguments, and then we open up to open floor Q&A and dialogue, not so much for the purpose of uh, debating and showing just how much intellectually superior we are, but so we can try and understand better where they're coming from. And so also I would recommend that uh, people not just limit their reading to books that already agree with them, but also read some of the best critics of the point of view from which they're coming. Um, so that they can understand better why people have come to the different conclusions that they've come to. Yeah, I really appreciate that answer, and I applaud you for doing that. Um, I I see, like if we, you, you and I are both, I have a master's in analytical chemistry, so you and I both come from a science-type background. And one thing I know that's different in the sciences compared to theology is that you can have people of different cultures arriving at the same conclusion on many scientific matters. And like, you know, the acceleration due to gravity at sea level, for example, is 9.8 meters per second squared, whether you're a Muslim, Jew, Christian, Hindu, whatever. And I don't see that when it comes to theology. And I don't see that even when it comes to viewing the evidence of the Gospels. I see people who study this stuff as a job coming to different conclusions as you. And then I... And I don't even pretend that I know as much as you do on these things. And I applaud you for your, your study and all these things. But as a lay person who does value truth, and I see these honest, sincere, uh, conscientious people doing the best they can, looking at the evidence, and coming up with different conclusions, I have to say to myself, maybe I should lower my confidence that this is true. Do you see what I'm saying? Um, I don't think com the fact that people can come to different conclusions in any way has any bearing on whether or not the stuff is true. So um, I, in, in any case, even, even if a consensus is reached, and uh, I think I can point to examples where a consensus has been reached in science or in biblical scholarship or what have you, and the reasons for that consensus being reached are not at all well-founded. Um, and in fact, there are good reasons to reject the consensus view. Um, so simply the fact that there's disagreement doesn't mean that it's not uh, something which we can study and actually come to a very well-informed and rationally warranted opinion on. Yeah, I agree with that. And I agree that sometimes the consensus is wrong. Um, but I guess in, when we're looking at what we believe, what we think we know, that we maybe have a little bit of humility and say, um, you know, even the consensus could be wrong. Um, mm -hmm. You know, even applied to your beliefs, I think, uh, what, two-thirds of biblical New Testament historians agree on a lot of things, uh, you know, what the Habermas talked about and so forth. But even that consensus could be wrong like, on the, what actually happened back then. Absolutely. That's why I never base my opinion on the consensus. So, right. um, you know, I, I always want to know, okay, so what, re what are the reasons for um, that lie behind the consensus? Why was the consensus reached? And are these reasons good reasons or not? 
Yeah, so how do we, um, if we're trying to search for truth and we see basically Christians coming up with one con conclusion who study the New Testament and non-Christians come up with another, like, uh, and I'll be honest, I get kind of upset when I hear Christians say, well, these guys are just blinded by the devil and or that and i'm sure you've heard these things too and maybe it is, upsets you as well but these are honest people doing their job and um they say well no i uh, we think the evidence maybe points one way and the those who are christians point another but, but we but we've, we've seen numerous numerous cases in biblical scholarship and in science where one's worldview or one's underlying or undergirding paradigm can actually color the way you view the evidence so for instance um in relation to can. the so no, it, 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 your the the way that you view the world, your worldview does often color the way you view the evidence. Right. So an example of that is um, Big Bang cosmology. Um, you know, the Big Bang as a as a model for cosmic origins was actually uh, vehemently opposed by many in the 20th century and resisted for a long time before it became the consensus model that became adopted because the evidence for it became so convincing and compelling. Uh, Big ba uh, the, the, the term Big Bang itself was coined by Fred Hoyle in a radio interview originally as a derogatory term. Um, and because the prior to that, the favorite model was a steady state paradigm. And I think one of the main reasons for the resistance to Big Bang cosmology was the implications of a cosmic beginning. Um, and, um, and I think that's also one reason for the resistance to intelligent design, which the evidence is becoming more and more um, convincing for. Um, so one's worldview, one's view of, of the world can, can very much color the way that you look at the evidence or, and what hypotheses or explanations you're open to. Okay. Yeah, and I agree with you. I think um, one's worldview should be, um, or it does have a huge impact on what we believe. But I guess, how do we change that? How do we, if, if we want to value this thing called truth, how do we put our worldviews on a shelf? Or do you think that's impossible? No, I, I, I don't think it's possible, ultimately. But I think that we can try to... Uh, to make sure that we are exposing ourselves to literature from diff from various different perspectives, so that we can, um, because when when we when we read literature that we disagree with, uh, that is coming that by an author who comes from from a, from a different angle than we do, it helps us to clarify in our own mind why we think that this is true, um, and it may even cause us to um, to reassess our beliefs if necessary as well. Okay. And what's your um, your take on the whole concept of, that Hume talked about, that as your claims go up, that the evidence should match it? Extraordinary claims require extraordinary evidence. Do, do, in principle, do you agree, disagree? Um, I think that uh, we do have extraordinary evidence for the resurrection. Um, but I, but um, I also, but so, so yeah, I, I would agree that we have extraordinary evidence for the resurrection. Um, so that's why I think that we are warranted rationally in accepting the resurrection to be true. But, it, but it, again, it depends on what you mean by extraordinary evidence. Yeah. I think we have very, very strong evidence for the resurrection, but what you mean by extraordinary evidence is going to be subjective to the individual. Yeah, I guess, I guess, and this is, Something I think uh, you as an apologist and other apologists have to work on, to be honest, uh, for guys like me. And that is, if I read a verse that says people came out of the graves um, and walked around Jerusalem, and it's, it says many or a lot, um, and the only way we can know this is through just text pa words on a piece of paper, to me, that's not an extraordinary evidence. Now, you can say, well, but you take that in combination with other things. But if you look at it claim by claim by claim, one at a time, I, I always love to ask the what's more likely question, because I'm a type of guy who doesn't like to be duped. So what's more right. likely that this actually happened or a book just says it did? Right. I mean, I, I'd prefer to talk about sufficient evidence rather than extraordinary evidence. Okay, I that's, think. that's um, fine. Um, so do, do we have sufficient evidence to conclude that Jesus rose from the dead? I think we do. Now, um, I mean, we can go into the specifics and the particulars if you wish. But my, my broad point, though, of what's more likely, and like if we take it off the Bible, I think you and I would agree on almost everything. Like, But, 
but m more likely given what? So, so you have to understand that I, on independent grounds, have good reason to think that God exists. Um, and I also have good reason to think that the ministry, life, and death of, of Jesus is uh, the culmination and climax of the Hebrew Scriptures. And so we have good reason to think that God exists and that he is able to raise Jesus from the dead. And we also have independent reason to think that God has pl plausibly has motivation for raising Jesus of Nazareth in particular from the dead. And so I would say that that raises the prior probability of the resurrection well, of Jesus. Well, if Jesus wasn't God in flesh— or God's son, however you want to put it, what would God's motivation be to raise him from the dead? Uh, if Jesus wasn't God, so if it was just some random Joe Blow in the middle of some miscellaneous village someplace, yeah. Um, and, and, so, um, or like, that, how that do you how, know that, that? How do you know that this God had a motivation to raise Jesus from the dead? Uh, be, because we can see that the ministry, life, and death. And, and resurrection of Jesus is the culmination and climax of the Hebrew scriptures. So the Hebrew scriptures have been anticipating the life of Jesus. And we can talk about uh, Messianic prophecy if you wish, but uh, that, that's why I think that the, the, the prior probability or the anterior probability of the resurrection is higher than for some miscellaneous bloke in, that's so if, in the middle of nowhere. Do you think you could ever be convinced by an Orthodox Jew that Jesus wasn't the Messiah? In principle, I mean, uh, uh, in principle, yeah, but I, I don't think that they have good arguments. I mean, I'm familiar with, with. I, mean, I think uh, Dr. Michael Brown has an excellent book series on uh, on answering Jewish objections to Jesus and um, respond to a lot of their objections to the. I've debated a Jewish um, skeptic called Michael Alter on the resurrection in particular of Jesus on Premier Christian Radio. Um, so in principle, yeah, if they had good arguments, but I don't find their arguments convincing. Yeah, and that's, you know, that's the question I keep coming back to, like, why, like, I've listened to a few Orthodox Jews talk, and from an outsider's perspective, <clears throat> and maybe, I don't know, maybe I'm, uh, to the Christians listening, it's like, they don't get it, they don't understand what I'm, I'm about to say, but when you're listening as an outsider who's not a Jew or a Christian, and you listen to the Orthodox Jew talk about why Jesus can't be the Messiah, it actually makes sense, <laughs> it really does. Um, and yet when I th look back at my own life, when I was a Christian, I couldn't see it. And so I'm wondering, oh man, this is scary. Like if our worldview is so powerful on how we even view the evidence, how do we figure out what's a reliable way of what coming to knowledge? Like how do we, this theory of knowledge thing, how do we, if we value this thing called truth, like it's really scary to me, Jonathan, to be honest, that that once how powerful that worldview can can impact on how we even see the evidence and that is why i th like things like rulers and robots cuz they don't have worldviews <laughs> you know they they're objective and i think that's why humans created these type of scientific tools um right can, yeah but no one does science in a vacuum, right? I mean, especially when it comes to things like origins, where did the universe come from, the origins of life, the origins of biological complexity, and so on. Everyone is doing their signs um, not in a vacuum, but um, in uh, but they but they have a, a paradigm which often underlies how they view the world and what explanations they believe to be possible. Okay, um, let me ask you a practical question. And this is a question. I, my wife is a believer. I think I said that. Uh, why do you think someone needs Christianity? Uh, because it's true. Okay, but <laughs> someone could could choose not to follow the truth, right? Right. So, so if is so, there a pragmatic so, yeah. reason for Christianity? So everything hinges on it being true. I mean, C.S. Lewis in Mere Christianity um, famously said that Christianity is a religion which, if false, is of no importance and if true of infinite importance, the one thing it cannot be is moderately important. So everything hinges on it being true. And right. it's true that um, hinges on the resurrection, of course. If Jesus rose from the dead bodily, then Christianity is true. If he did not rise from the dead, Christianity is false. Um, and so if Christianity is true, then, yes, it has absolutely huge bearing um, on how we should live our lives, um, because the, the because the message of the gospel is that God is holy, and we've sinned and we've fallen short of a holy God, and and God demonstrating His own love for us in the person of Christ, who died on the cross for us. So yeah, it's it's absolutely fundamental if it's true. Yeah, I 
I hear what you're saying, but I guess my question is that um, for someone like me who has a different epistemology than you, because I just cannot see any case right now, I could change, but I cannot see any case right now where textual evidence would ever rise to the level of justifying a knowledge claim that a man rose from the dead or zombies walked through the streets of Jerusalem or a man walked on water and so forth. But there could be something today that might change my mind. And I've said in past interviews what would change my mind. Um, but um, how, how would you answer the person who would say, okay, look, I struggle with believing that this is true. Can you give reasons why one should even attempt to even look into it? Or what are the benefits of Christianity? What are, like, for example, let's say Hinduism could be true. If someone doesn't have a need to study Hinduism, they would never even investigate it. They would, wouldn't care to. Why should someone care? Besides it, well, you should care about the truth, but why should, what are some practical reasons to be a Christian? And this is a question I asked my, my wife about a couple years ago, and she couldn't answer it because she knows me, and she knows that I'm, I don't have any, uh, you know, addictions. Well, nicotine gum, but um, <laughs> uh, I don't have to pray to, to, to pay the electric bill. Uh, what is this ultimate need i'm content happy in my life why do i need christianity because we're sinners and because we've offended a holy god and the just consequence of our sin is an eternity separated from the favorable presence of god and it's only it's only by christ that we can actually be saved by by trusting in his completed work on the cross saved from what saved from an eternity separated from the favorable presence of god and why is that bad? Um, because um, that's um, the eternal judgment for our sin. But why is that judgment bad? Because it's eternally separated from God's rule and presence. In fact, not just that, but enduring the wrath of God for all eternity. I guess I'm getting to, like, is, are you saying that if you're not a Christian, a true Christian, that when you die, you'll be in pain? Uh, yes, I believe in eternal conscious torment. Okay. This concept of pain for eternity, has that always existed? What do you mean by that? Like, I don't know, 10,000 years ago, um, mm -hmm. if I wasn't a Christian or a Jew and I died, is it the same answer? Like I would be tormented in hell? Yeah, I, I think that that's the consequence of sin, yeah. If that concept of hell was removed from your theology and there there was no let's say you're an annihilist or whatever you know that you die and that's your soul's gone what would you say then like would there be any good reason to be a christian because there's nothing uh, there's no eternal judgment to be saved from then uh but the whole message of the gospel is god demonstrating his love for us in christ who drank the cup of divine wrath on our behalf on the cross. So uh, without the concept of God's judgment for sin, there is no gospel left. Uh, so actually the belief of hell supersedes the belief in Jesus, because if there is no hell, then there's no need for Jesus. Is that correct? If, if there's no judgment for sin, then there is no purpose for Jesus to die on the cross, correct? So the key to believing in Jesus is first to realize that there's this thing called hell or judgment first. Well, the, um, the evidence for the reality of that is the truth of Jesus' self-claims. So, um, so we demonstrate that Jesus actually rose from the dead, that the Gospels are substantially correct reports of Jesus' life. And then since we have demonstrated Jesus' identity, then we can take seriously th things that he says in relation to hell and so forth. Does the Old Testament talk about this concept of people suffering in hell for eternity? Not the New Testament, the Old uh, Testament. The Old Testament um, speaks about um, God, um, God's judgment um, for sin um, after death, yeah. 
So, um, I, and again, I, I'm asking honestly, you know more about this than me, but yeah. so do or Orthodox Jews believe in this concept of eternal torment in hell for non-Jews? Um, um, I've not actually, I'm not actually aware of, um, of that. I'm not familiar with the literature on that. Because my understanding was that the whole concept of hell only came around when Jesus did, the concept of Jesus. Um, let me pull up some references. That the good news of salvation was coincided with the bad news of hell. And in my mind, that's a push. <laughs> oh, 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 you're back. I'm sorry, you were cut out there. Can you say that again? I was just saying that the good, from my understanding, um, that the good news. Hello? Uh, you, I'm still here. Can you hear me? I think he's um, trying to find something on his computer and that caused his connection to go awry. He'll be back. I'll message him. Uh, and yeah, you're back. I think when you did something on your computer, yeah, it, yeah, right. yeah I wouldn't mess around with your computer because it seems like it, it. Sorry. Yeah, I was just looking up some um, um, Bible gateway. Um, so yeah, so in the Old Testament, for example, in Daniel 12, 2, you have um, many of those who sleep in the dust of the earth um, shall awake, some to everlasting life and some to shame and everlasting contempt. Um, and um, so there, there is a concept of um, judgment and um, after death in the Old Testament. Yeah, that, but that sounds a lot different. Like some will be awake, some will be dead. Like a, it doesn't sound like, you know, either believe in this one Messiah or you are in hell for eternity. Right. The, the, I mean, the Messiah hadn't been revealed in the Old Testament. I mean, you've got prophecies anticipating the coming of the Messiah, but you have, um, um, but, so it's, but the Old Testament saints are under a different covenant than the, the one that we are under now. But does that, as a Christian, has that ever bothered you, that that whole, the good news of salvation necessarily coincided the bad news of hell? And it was almost like, um, I know other religions had that a concept of hell before Christianity, uh, or a, yeah, maybe not before Judaism, but does it bother you at all that those two kind of entered the world at the same time? Did you ever go, huh, this what? is weird. What, Christianity? No, no, hell? The, the, the concept of salvation necessarily came with the concept of hell. Did you ever puzzle about that? Like, why, like, it really is not talked about it that much in the Old Testament. And then this concept of Jesus comes along of saving, saving from what? From hell. Oh, where did this concept of hell come from? Well, that's, you know, that's, uh, where did the concept of hell come from? Uh, I, I'm not quite sure I understand the, the, the question. So, yeah, there's the doctrine of eternal salvation. Um, there's the doctrine of hell. Why is it strange that they come, that, that they're both in the Bible? Well, I guess, and this is a crude analogy, so forgive me. But to me, let's say you're not a Christian, you're an outsider, you're looking from the outside in. It almost sounds like a doctor walking around selling Band-Aids. But in order to sell the Band-Aid, he cuts people first. The Band-Aid is worth, worthless unless there's something to fix. <laughs> and right. it, it's, and, but, the, but, but, the re, but the reason why um, our just desserts are eternity separated from the favorable presence of God is because of our sin. Um, so it's our doing that results in our need for salvation. Right, but I'm, and I think there's Christians out there who don't believe in, well, there's, they, it runs the gamut on their version of hell, what they believe in, but um, even when I was a Christian, and, and when I look back now as a non-Christian at it, it was interesting to me that this concept of hell only showed its face in this way when Jesus came around. And I thought, whoa, that's kind of strange. Like, we're talking about eternal torment here. Like, shouldn't there have been people back in the Old Testament saying, look, you need to, you need to live this way. Otherwise, God is going to punish you, not just here on this earth, but in the afterlife. And yet, you don't read about that. 
like, other than maybe a few hints of it, like a Hades and so forth. But to me, as now looking back, I'm going, this is a red flag to me. It's like you're creating a need and a solution for that need. Do you see what I'm saying? No, there, there, there's a concept of God's judgment in the Old Testament as well. Um, the, and then the, the whole Old Testament is looking forward in anticipation of the coming of Christ, which is the solution. But to is there a concept of eternal judgment in a place called hell or Hades in the Old Testament? I just gave you the reference. I gave you a reference in Daniel 12, where it says that many of those who sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake, some to everlasting life and some to shame and everlasting contempt. So this is, that's speaking of uh, the general resurrection at the end of the world, when some uh, uh, the, the saints will awake to everlasting life, and those who are, who are not will awake to shame and everlasting contempt, as in the Old Testament. And you're saying that the contempt means everlasting hell of pain and suffering? On, not yeah. on earth, but somewhere else. Yeah, I mean, I don't, I don't know the nature of, of um, that suffering. I don't know the nature of hell. We're not given a huge amount of information on it in Scripture, but it's certainly a place that we don't want to be. Yeah, I, the reason why I'm spending so much time on this is because uh, from an outsider's perspective, without the concept of hell, there's no need for Christianity. And so in that sense, the belief in hell supersedes the belief in Jesus, because if there's no hell literal hell, then there's no need for Jesus. Unless you can come up with another reason, which some have, like when I've talked to people in the past, they've said, well, Doug, I just experienced so much joy with my relationship with Jesus. And so even if there is no hell, that alone is a good reason. Do you agree with that? Right. I mean, the, re the reason why I'm a Christian, apart from the fact that it's true, is not um, fear of hell. Um, the pr primary reason why I'm 